All 8 billion of us are doing metabolism at all times. This show is about learning what metabolism is, how it affects you in every way possible from mood and mental state to performance and energy. We are all about fine tuning the human experience for you to achieve the best self you can be. And if you are someone who loves science, curious to know how your body works and how to optimize it, then you are in the right place. This is the HVMN Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome back to the HVMN Podcast and I'm your host, Dr. Lat Mansour, a PhD in Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics and the Research Lead of Health via Modern Nutrition. And if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a review and if you have any question, leave us a comment and as always, we appreciate it if you can share it with a friend. Now without further ado, let's get into this episode of HVMN Podcast. Hi, this episode, we have Dr. Anthony Gustin, who is a board-certified functional medicine practitioner, the founder of several health brands, including Perfect Keto and Equip Foods, investor and advisor to many companies in the health space, and is now embarking on a journey as a farmer to learn how our food system is broken and what to do about it. You can find his content online at Dr. Anthony Gustin on any social media channels and listen to his podcast called The Natural State, anywhere podcasts are streamed. So thank you again for tuning in and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to the HVMN podcast, Dr. Anthony Gustin. Hi, how are you? Doing phenomenal. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, been a while since I last spoke to you. I was on your podcast and actually one of your listeners DM me on Instagram said that, hey, I, I listened to you on Dr. Anthony Gustin's podcast and learned so much about ketones and can you tell me more? So thank you so much for having me on your platform and I'm glad and very grateful to be able to offer you to be on our platform now. Yeah, well, I'm honored to be a guest. For our listeners to know you better, would you mind telling us your story, how you went from a doctor to being a founder of Perfect Keto, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners know what Perfect Keto is, and go from there to what you're doing now, which is also another very interesting topic. Yeah, it's this story changes a lot every year, and I never try to predict what it's going to be like. But I, I was really sick when I was younger. I was I grew up in the Midwest in Minnesota, and sort of a classic Midwest standard American diet, just eating pop tarts and Cheetos, and like all, this is was one hundred percent my diet. And I got really sick, really overweight, acne, bunch of health problems. But it was normal, and this is the problem that I think a lot of people are still in. So I have empathy around people when they have health problems because. I had no models of healthy people when I was growing up. Every single person that I knew ate this way and looked the way I did. It wasn't until, maybe it was because of the internet. I don't even remember why. Maybe TV, I don't know. I realized that I, you know, I did not want to live that life, out there for a different life, sort of went on a fast track, and then worked through a lot of my own health issues and knew I wanted to help other people um, prevent a lot of the things that I knew were preventable. I mean, this is the thing that I was told before I figured it out for myself, which was, this is just the way it is. It's your genetics. It's, you know, X, Y, and Z thing. You just have acne. You just have these things. Your whole family is just overweight. That's just the way it is. And that's obviously not the case. And so my life essentially has been different threads of trying to figure that out of why are people so sick? What's going on? How can we change things to help incentivize them to have better metabolic health, better uh, just overall healthy lifestyle? Because it's really not that hard when you come down to it. You know, we can get into my philosophy around, you know, how I think about health broadly, but how that went was I was kind of on a fast track. The only way I knew how to do that was to be a clinician. And so didn't want to go to kind of standard medical care. It was just from what I saw, from what I got prescribed, my family, et cetera, was a bunch of prescriptions and sort of chronic disease management rather than any sort of a solution. I actually worked with a, a chiropractor in PT clinic early on in high school and had a lot of help from them sort of reframe a lot of my health beliefs. So I went on fast track, uh, got my doctorate in chiropractic, master's in sports rehab and did a lot with athletes. So then started working with pro athletes and doing a lot with musculoskeletal work and then transitioned into functional medicine work. So dealing with more of labs, trying to figure out what's going on with actual um, conditions that people had. And no matter what, I figured out, you know, nutrition was always the biggest linchpin that if we could fix that, then everything else would sort of unravel for every, everyone else. And also looking at the chronic diseases, metabolic health was such a, an important thing to address to sort of unlock next steps in pretty much every single thing, whether it's obesity, diabetes, you know, heart disease, et cetera. 
obviously you guys know a lot about that. I'm sure you've talked about it a lot in the uh, podcast. That led me down to figuring out a ketogenic diet. So I was using that a lot as a tool in my clinic and thought, man, I wonder if there was some way we could help more people and do this at scale and try to convince more people about the, the benefits of a ketogenic diet, low carb, but more broadly speaking, the importance of metabolic health. I think that ketosis is just a tool for most people in the modern age to reverse a lot of the metabolic damage that they've incurred through their environment throughout their lifetime. Do I think it's a necessary thing for all human beings? No. Do I think that all human beings should be able to get into a state of ketosis? Yes. But it was just looking at the population of how many people are actually metabolically fit, like depending on what sort of survey you're looking at, we're looking at high 80s, low 90s percent are, are metabolically dysfunctional. And so it's obviously a huge, huge tool we need to apply. So started posting a lot about that, gained a little bit of audience, and uh, had before that a company, Dylan, dealt in uh, real food products. So we still have that. It's called Equip Food. So beef protein powder, sweet potato powder, things like that. And I just realized one day that I was only going to help so many people in my clinics. I, I had at that point six locations in my clinics and did the math. And even if I had 20 clinic locations, there's only a f- top number of people. And I saw so many people who were having so many problems. So Launch Perfect Keto is a way to provide easy access, information, products, et cetera, to make a ketogenic lifestyle. Especially at that point, no one knew what the hell it was. It was very confusing. So our goal is to put out the most amount of content, products, guides, et cetera, to not only educate people about what ketosis is, but kind of sneak in to a certain degree, all the other things about lifestyle, diet, exercise, sleep, stress management, et cetera, that I think a lot of people in the early days, especially with you know dirty keto and things like that, if it fits your macros, it's totally fine, which I'm sure you and I could chat a lot about, but that kept going. That did very well. Um, we helped a lot of people. As I started digging into that, peeling back the, the layers of the onion, so to speak, I just realized that it, it honestly it doesn't, yes, it matters to a certain degree, but food source and where our food comes from is so much more important because when I was sort of in this, you know, people with ketosis, things like that, the food quality was just such an important element. And we can talk about, you know, seed oils and how people, you know, when I was working with a lot of people in the keto, keto space, they would be eating a lot of fat, but be eating a lot of meals that were either high in polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids or seed oils. And that just led to massive amount of continuation of problems. And so just obsessing over food quality and where our food comes from, boy, I, like it, <laughs> that really just took me down a rabbit hole. So I got obsessed with food system, food production, and what I think to be the only way we can really produce food in a truly sustainable way, which is via regenerative agriculture. So after I left Perfect Keto, I then got a small farm and have been testing things on a farm. So now I'm working as a small farmer, but now working on a bunch of different projects as well. But yeah, the thing I care about most is what we're, you know, if you, again, if you keep asking the, the same question of why are people so sick and what can we do about it? I think it's kind of coalesced for me around so many things around food system and food production, but beyond just nutrition. I, I think that there's a lot that we assume that like health is because just boiled down to what you eat. And I just realized more of like who I've worked with in my own journey in general, that it's way more than physical health. It's way more than nutrition and supporting a small farmer and supporting a large, uh, small community is sort of a proxy for having checked a lot of boxes on the journey to be having a rich, complete human experience. So it's been a weird journey and I don't know where it's going to go, but that's it's, where we're at now. It's like going back to the root of the problem, right? The source of the foods and then the food being the source of the disease or the source of the health, so to say. And you are essentially one of the pioneers in the keto space, right? And and thank you for paving the way of the, you know, for the education, for the knowledge and the data that is out there for people to even know what ketosis is. You know, as you were telling the story of you going from a doctor uh, to become a farmer, I thought of something really ironic. Um, growing up in Asia, every single parent will want their kids to be doctors, right? You have to study hard in school so that you become a doctor and not be a farmer because, you know, doctors make more money and all of that. And then you 
when the complete opposite, you were a doctor and you now you're a farmer. So um, the irony, it's, it's, it's funny um, for me, you know, we hearing all this pressure and all this um, expectation growing up. It's like, oh yeah, you got to be doctor, you got to be engineer, architect, you know, scientist. Um, but, you know, what you're doing is impacting a lot of people um, both in the perfect keto sort of sort of realm and, and perspective as well as what you're doing now. So let's let's dive into the science a little bit. So when you were explaining about you know uh, when you were having health problems you know growing up and they were telling you that it's a genetic problem. So recently I made a video um, in response to the CBS 60 Minute uh, of a professor, a doctor in from Harvard saying that. Number one cause of obesity is genetics. Uh, tell us your thoughts around that. All you have to do is just look at the data around obesity rates over the last 100 years to know that this is complete insanity. Yeah. It's really that simple. Did, like, how did we just have some weird genetic polymorphism that led to nearly no one being obese 100 years ago to the, the majority of people being overweight or obese now? And if that's the case, we need to we need to understand what's going on with our genetics. Why are our genetics changing rapidly for the first time in human history? Exactly, exactly. Even if it's genetic, like even if it's mutation, like for it to to change so fast and to manifest into a phenotype that is so prominent, it's it's ridiculously um, unrealistic. It's it's patently absurd. It's obvious what what is going on right now. There, I mean, obviously, I'm sure you've kind of pulled on the thread and seen these medications, these GLP-1 medications, um, and how, yeah, they, they're working with these medications now that they can prescribe to kids as young as 12 years old. And science is out still yet on, on what's going on, but there's been some case studies showing that if you go off, you could potentially gain up to two times the weight. So these are lifelong medications. Wow. You you're going to be taking these for literally your entire life. And I don't, I don't blame the parents. I don't blame the teachers. I don't blame the researchers. We have an entire system that's stacked against us. And what we're told is should be working isn't working. And I agree with that. But that doesn't mean that we should just put kids who are 12 years old on a lifelong medication. This easily could have been me. It could have been me too. I was I was overweight growing up, so I understand that. And and m even worse, like in the broadcast, they they sort of interviewed you know patients who are on semaglutide on, on this drug, knowingly that they go they're going to be on this drug for their entire life. But on top of that, they still have to maintain good diet and exercise. I, I mean, I just, I don't know how the thinking isn't so obvious in the case of this and many others where we clearly don't have a semaglutide deficiency. It, it, you have to change the narrative to make it a genetic thing that's unsolvable to be able to say, okay, well, thrown in the towel, the only option we have left is now this, this medication that you have to take the rest of your life, which I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. I think that people, humans are just motivated by greed mostly. And we, are, we live in an economic machine that rewards more money and more things all the time. And I think that's just what's going on here. We have big pharma pushing things. We have, everybody's kind of trying to get their own, especially in the Western world. And we have this element of separation where like it's all about the individual. And that pushes us to making at large decisions for individual people to just have more money. And it's really sick and it's, it's awful. Yeah, absolutely. So hearing your story and, and just, you know, just your instruction alone, I can see that you're a problem solver. You have a problem, you solve it for yourself, you solve it for other people, and then you want to scale it, right? Same thing when you're a doctor, same thing when you're perfect keto, same thing now when, you know, you're, you're a farmer, right? Tell us what problem do you see in the current food system that you're trying to solve? I actually have a list of 38 problems, I think, of <laughs> why I think our food system is in a dangerous place that could collapse roughly imminently. Okay, give us, give us a few highlights, yeah. The entire narrative that we have around food production currently is, can we do this to feed everybody? Will we be able to do this to feed the population in 2050? And I think it's a completely wrong question to ask. 
the question we need to ask is what food production method can we do to remain productive? Because nearly every way we're making food currently, by definition, is unsustainable. Meaning we are taking more resources out of the planet than we are putting back. If we had a bank account and we were withdrawing more than we were depositing, at some point you go bankrupt and bad things happen. And we are at the same exact thing from a food system level and no one's talking about it. I think that's probably the, the biggest thing. What sort of solution you think we should be looking at? You know, okay, so let's say now people are going to start looking at the current food system, current agricultural system to say that, okay, this is not sustainable. We are using resources more than um, we replenish the resource. What can we do? Um, so tell us more about what you do and, and what can we do as, as consumers as well? Yeah, this is a great question. This is a very nuanced answer depending on the region. So what may work in Georgia versus Washington versus somewhere in Asia is going to be completely different. But in general, there are some foundational things that must be the case. So ironically, compared to what mainstream media tells you, you must have animal involvement. Must have animals in it. The only way that I know of currently where we can produce food on an ongoing basis is via animal agriculture. There's no way to produce plants, especially at the, the rate we're producing them and how we're producing them. There's no model. Plant production, by definition, is extractive. So you're taking more out than you're putting in, period. Animal agriculture is very interesting where it is it can be uh, regenerative. And so this term is being thrown around a lot lately, regenerative agriculture. It's becoming greenwashed very quickly. So a lot of people are using it because there's not a definition on it to say, oh, this is regenerative, that's regenerative, because there's, there's not really a good measurement on it. What most people are doing is taking measurements of carbon, carbon in, carbon out, which is as dumb as saying that human health as the entire organism is as simple as calories in, calories out. It's just absurd. It is one thing that does not dictate the health of an ecosystem. <laughs> Regenerative agriculture should be making the ecosystem healthier, more resilient, more productive, um, more diversified over time. And so there's ways to do that, especially with animal agriculture, of mimicking a natural environment. And so, for example, if you just have a 100-acre parcel of land and you have a bunch of cattle on it, they will selectively eat there, they will overgraze, and it will end up becoming a, an extractive model because the ground will not be able to be recovered. And that's not how nature has ever worked before. So these animals, as herd animals, have been moved around by predators. We killed all of the predators, and now we have fences everywhere. So we can't have natural predators, but what we can have is we can mimic that by rotating the animals. And so when we move the animals from one, so let's say we took that same hundred acres and chopped it up into a hundred small parcels and had all the cattle on one parcel and then move them the next day and the next day and the next day. What actually happens here is that you get stimulation from the animals being on the land. They defecate, they urinate, they chew the grass in a certain way that stimulates growth and builds up soil organic matter and soil carbon. So that way, when they come back, it is actually a more diverse ecosystem. They bring up old seed banks that haven't been there in a long time. They restore the capacity for the soil to retain water. And when you have these animals rotating around like this, this is exactly what nature had before. We have all these broken ecosystems. Pretty much every single farm and every, every place we farmed, we have completely moonscaped relative to how nature should be. So you go back in history and you see, you know, even my wife's dad, my father, like he's a... He does prairie restoration in Minnesota where I grew up. I didn't know what it should have looked like. I go back to where he does prairie restorations and the native grasses there are eight, 10 feet high in places. And you have to mow paths and it, they're beautiful, lush, and they provide such diverse ecosystem for wildlife, animals, et cetera. We went in there, cut everything down, sprayed everything with herbicides, pesticides, put fences up, put animals there for too long, in a species inappropriate way and destroy the ecosystem. So all everybody knows, just like when I was younger, all I knew were fat and sick people. All everybody knows about farms and far farming is what they see with some cattle on a thing. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's what you see on TVs, on, on movies, yeah. Yeah, right. And it's some of these farmers who are doing these practices who are starting to do this are getting back to the point 
where they are getting grass so tall that they're losing their cattle down. And this is the way the majority of the, the rangelands and grasslands in the, in the United States used to be. Not too long ago. Why? Because we had 65 million bison roaming around, 65 million antelope roaming around. We had, we had so many ruminants that were in these huge migratory herds that would have this impact on the land. The land would rest. The ecosystem would heal. And we've destroyed all of that. And so the capacity for the land and for the land to be productive goes up dramatically when you raise animals in this way. And you make the land better and better and better. And the, the stocking density, for example, is like, for example, a 100 acre of parcel of land. How many cattle can you have on there? Some of these models have shown that if you manage it in this way, you can four, six, eight, ten 10x the amount of animals you can have on the property. The amount of uh, water that can be held on the property goes up 10,000 gallons per acre for every 1% of soil organic matter is in there. And some of these farms are getting 1% increase per year. And so when you look at carbon and some of these things like that, you have White Oak Pastures did a study where for every one pound of beef you're eating, you're actually getting four pounds of carbon sequestration from the environment into the soil. So even if you want to reduce it to a carbon in, carbon out metric, which again, I think is a very foolish way to do it, you if you look at beyond or impossible or some of these greenwash companies that don't actually incorporate all of their, like what happened, like are they incorporating the energy and resources it takes to make factories and trucks and all? No, they're not. But even when you're looking at their production of the food, it's for every pound produced, four pounds of carbon goes in the atmosphere. And so again, not, it's not, that's not sustainable. Even if you want to like look at them making factories, trucks, all this type of stuff. And so the only way we can really do that, again, is animal involvement. And some people are starting to get really clever. So in some places, adding grains into that, adding in crops into that, but having the animals go through the rows of the crops. So that way you have the animal impact. No ecosystem on the planet anywhere is free of animals. And when you start taking animals off the ecosystem, the ecosystem rapidly degrades. We see, it, we see that principle preserved literally across the entire planet. And that's what all of plant agriculture is currently, all of it, 100% of it, is reducing life as much as possible to have one thing grow. We can get into why that's such an awful thing. It's called monocrop. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 again, you're, just, you're making the soil quality worse and worse and worse. You're leaching minerals and nutrients out of the soil and not replace, re replenishing them. And the opposite thing happens when you do animal agriculture appropriately. Uh, all my memories of agriculture by technology classes is now coming back to me. <laughs> all these terms, this the monocrop and 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 you know the rotating um, the different crops during different seasons, for example, to try and try and keep the diversity. Uh, but obviously, at that, that time, I don't believe I have learned in uh, in terms of including animals. Um, as you have described so nicely there. So that's very interesting. And the rotation that you, you mentioned, does it have to be on a daily basis or does it, it's, it's weekly basis okay, you know, for, 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 for farmers to, you know, like you said, you, you have 100 different squares of the 100 ac acres. When you rotate the animals, is it every day has to be or, or does it matter? Every piece of property is completely different and the conditions are different. The seasons are different. The animals are different. So depending on like how much it rained, for example, mm -hmm. um, my, one of the farms next to me has cattle on it and it was raining a lot in Texas recently. And so they had to move more frequently because the animals had a different impact on it. So this is the thing, like you need a human there to pay attention and to be a participant in this and be connected to the ecosystem, to the animals, to the weather, to all this type of stuff which is, again, the complete opposite thing that we're having currently, which is what we're talking about with the problem with these corporations and these individuals who are just trying to make money. You, mm. you can only do that in a vacuum where you're not connected to the ecosystem. And that's why, again, I think that supporting a local farm, going to visit your farm, knowing where your food comes from, farming yourself, growing any food in your backyard, having any sort of connection to life beyond yourself. Like we, we, just, we live in such an artificial world. We, we tend to think of we live inside, and that means like we have light exposure and all these things, again, for our own individual health. 
but we don't have any connection to anything else that's really living. We might have a, there's a plant here. There might be a plant next to you inside, but that's it. Otherwise you live in a sterile Tupperware container. And most people live in a city and they don't actually participate at all with any sort of light, life. Mm -hmm. It is all just an extractive thing for the individual. And when you go out and you start participating, and this is something that I've noticed as well around like my own journey, perspective on life changes dramatically. And I just found it to be an unlock. And one of the first things, I, I took this trip with Paul Saladino. I think you guys, he was on the podcast not too long ago. Um, and just understanding that these people who live so intimately in nature and have the ultimate connection of nature is irreplaceable. And we don't, we don't ever regard that as really important beyond just, oh, I need some fresh air. I need some good light or whatever. It literally rewires your brain and how you view the world and how you interact with other humans and other living things, how you consume food. And it, I think it's the fundamental part about all of this. Of We can talk all day long about the importance of nutrient quality, and, and I could spew out all these data and figures around why re even this rotational grazing is far superior than quote-unquote grass-fed, and then also over grain-fed. It just, at the end of the day, like if, if you're just still completely devoid of any sort of connection to your food system and you're just buying your food and packages and slamming it down your mouth and not have any idea, I think we're just going to keep repeating the same problems and getting to the same point of trying to scale things, trying to be ultra effective, try to be ultra efficient and not really understand our place in things. Because again, like when it comes down to it, you start thinking about problems to be solving and you drive yourself nuts. Like you said, I, I tend to think of like, how can I solve these problems? But like at the end of the day, if we don't have food to eat, if we don't have food to eat in 50 years or 100 years or 500 years, what is the point of solving any other problem? I, I think it's like the, the most important thing that people aren't talking about that's literally right in our face right now. I, there's this author, who his name is Wendell Berry. He's written about this stuff for the last 80 years. And I went to go visit him last year. One of the best conversations I've ever had. It was a very honored to, to meet this guy. He's written over 100 books. And I asked him what he's most hopeful for in our generation. And he said that we'll have something to eat in the next 50 years. And he's a farmer. He's been researching this stuff intimately for a long time. His seminal work, 1976, he published this book called Unsettling of America, which actually coincidentally changed my father-in-law into doing more restoration, buying a farm. And now I know probably about 15 people who've read that book and have bought a farm, including me. Um, so I'd recommend that as, as reading if anybody, if this is interesting to anybody, but yeah, I mean, it's just talk about problems to solve. I think that the food system is not just food as a product. It's how we're actually consuming and participating in the cycle of life. I think it's, it's ultimately important. That's, that's really interesting as well. Cause I remember growing up, you know, my mom had a backyard and she'll always plant her vegetables and all of that. Um, I mean, we didn't have like farm or animals or all of that, but that was, you know, what we sort of partake. And then as I grew up, as I studied overseas, abroad in big universities, usually they're in big cities and very much, like you said, devoid of any connection to our food system and agricultural system. Um, so there's a lot of things that I don't know. Um, especially, like you said, like different countries, different lands, different seasons, they have different way of, of farming and different way of producing food. Uh, I've, I've learned so much since I've come to America um, on how the U.S. produce food. And again, you know, you sharing this information, it's, it's something new to me and something really enlightening. Um, so thank you for that. And let's go back to, to health for a second. So, you know, we talked about our perspective in life and our participation in the life cycle and all of that. And let's talk about health and the current challenge that we have with metabolic health, with obesity, with diabetes, with inflammation. All of this, you know, obviously has a lot to do with our foods, our nutrition. What do you think? that seed oil is one of the main culprit or is that one of many um, other culprits that is causing this metabolic health uh, dysfunction? Um, and what are they? 
Yeah, I just, my notebook's across the table here. I, the other day, I was on a flight, and I took out like five pages writing out this huge map of like all of the main things that I think are making people sick. Ultimately, I think it's, the framework in which I view it is that we are in an artificial environment, and whenever you take an organism and put it into a different environment than it, than it is genetically meant to be, bad things are going to happen. And I'm not a huge proponent. I don't think it's possible to go back. So I think a lot of people want me into like the ancestral paleo, paleo sort of like tr trad life kind of movement. And I don't think that's the case. I think we need to figure out solutions moving forward. And sometimes that's mimicking the environment that best matches our genes. And so you have, for example, if you look at a squirrel and you saw a squirrel outside and it was coughing and it was three times the size and it was limping along, you would ask, what is going on with this animal? And you would be looking around about what was causing the problem. And we're not doing that anymore. And I think what, what generally happens when people, they think this way, of like, okay, I understand the concept of there's this environmental mismatch with genes, which leads to these issues. A lot of times there is also a resultant dysfunction or disease that needs an artificial intervention. And so, for example, if a train is running on tracks smoothly and it flies off the tracks because the tracks are bent, the bent tracks of the artificial environment that led to a, a disease or, or dysfunction of the, the train off the tracks. If you fix the normal environment, which is necessary for the train to run again, it doesn't mean that the train's going to run again. You need an intervent intervention of taking that train and putting it back on the tracks, but you also need a restoration of the natural uh, ecosystem, which is the tracks. What we tend to do is mimic the natural environment, maybe eat some good foods, but don't look at the underlying issue of fixing the, the intervention. So like, what are the biggest things, is this just kind of how I think about it, that take us off, of tr off the tracks? And then what are the biggest things we need to do to then get back on track? And this is kind of like to go full circle around keto and metabolic dysfunction and carbohydrates, things like that. I have now shifted my belief to, to thinking that the number one, I think this is a very multifactorial thing. We like, like I said, I had filled four pages in my notebook of all the things that, that take us off the track and how our environment is screwed up. I think seed oils are probably number one thing. Looking into the data, that leads to metabolic dysfunction. The intervention coming back I think ketosis is a tremendous tool to restoring that pathway, reducing carbohydrates. And the, the narrative when I was going through is even the book that I wrote, Keto Answers, around this was too much carbohydrates leads to metabolic dysfunction, so decrease carbohydrates, and you should decrease the metabolic dysfunction. And it's a very simplistic way to view it. I think, yes, increase carbohydrates, especially increase ultra-processed carbohydrates, lead to a lot of issues. We uh, like, you can't deny that. But I think increased seed oils, polyunsaturated fatty acids, acids, linoleic acids specifically, lead to even more damage. And the worst thing is to eat both of these in combination, which is most of the processed food that we eat, pack packaged food that we eat. So I think the, the, com the sort of one-two punch is the worst thing for sure. And if you were then to extract them, it's then seed oils and then carbohydrates on, the on their own. I just, there's so many examples that I have of people eating a lot of carbohydrates, not having any metabolic dysfunction. Take Japanese culture, for example, the most Asian, Asian cultures. This was like a paradox. Th this was basically like the modern version of the French paradox, where we said, oh, these French people have, are eating butter. Why, are, why don't they have heart disease? Well, it turns out the butter wasn't the problem. And the same thing with Asian cultures, like, oh, all these Asian people are eating so much rice and things like that. Like, why, aren't they, why don't they have diabetes? Well, it turns out it wasn't the carbohydrates problem in the first place. And that, you start looking at then the incidence of diabetes in J Japan is going through the roof. And then you overlay that in the chart of seed oil consumption. And when they started incorporating that, and it looks the same as smoking and lung cancer. And we could go on and on and on about you know, from all the way from ancestral philosophy to epidemiology to clinical trials, mechanistic stuff, et cetera. It seems like quite a smoking gun to me. And I know it can be controversial because you have all the institutions, just like when we had talking about fat, not going to kill you. 
every single person and every single credentialed expert in every single institution held on so tightly because they have to admit then that they were wrong. And if they were wrong, they were complicit in the death and misery of millions of people. And this is where we're at right now. For Harvard Health to change their stance on seed oil is good, seed oil is heart healthy, not only do they have to admit that they're not good or neutral, they then have to admit they were wrong about fat for the last 65 years. So it, it's this type of change, just it's hard to come across and it takes a long time. But I think I've just been, I'm not even that old, but I feel like I've been around in this industry 15 plus years, 20 years now to, to understand that this stuff takes time, come, it comes in waves, but people change their mind. The amount of people that have changed their mind on keto and when I first started talking about this stuff and when I heard people talking about it 10 years ago, I mean, the, the Volks and Finneys of the world and everybody talking about, oh, it's dangerous and confusing with ketoacidosis. And now how many people have switched their mind and are implementing this for therapeutic reasons and appreciate? I think it happened really quickly. I think things are happening quicker and quicker and quicker. And hopefully the same thing will happen with seed oils because if, if it doesn't change, like we have all the evidence we need. This is the Fred Coomer, the guy who found trans fats. And then do you know his story about how he then petitioned and sued the FDA and got trans fats banned? No, please do share. It's an amazing story. I, I will not tell it as eloquently as somebody like uh, Tucker Goodrich, who you should have on the podcast talk about seed oils. But basically there's this guy, he was like 103. He was a fatty acid researcher almost his entire life. And I can't remember the exact details, but the FDA was sitting on the information that trans fats were terrible for humans and toxic. And they were doing nothing about it. So he sued the FDA. I can't remember the exact things here. One, force the FDA to put this ban on trans fats. That's where the ban on trans fats happened. This guy doing this, he was convinced that linoleic acid and seed oils in general were a factor worse than trans fats. Not to say like he's the only expert and like he didn't, you know, we don't need to consider more evidence, but it's just if that guy working on things for a hundred and three year old and to have that amount of information, and he has all this work published for the last 60 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, again, I think that when it comes down to it, it's, you just got to follow the money when it, when it's, processed food ingredients like this who's winning and who's losing and who's losing has like essentially no say in the matter because it's about you know we used to process foods throughout our entire human history for increasing food nutrient availability and now we're processing foods in modern history for increasing profitabilities and maximizing and extracting as much profit as possible and so you have to just ask the the from the food quality perspective is this process, pro, quote unquote, processing? Because all these nerds online will say, well, chewing's processing and cooking's processing. And so you're processing that, grinding meat into hamburgers processing. Is it processing it to increase the nutrient availability? Soaking grains, sprouting grains. Great, I'm all about that. Versus literally processing it just to make it more convenient to sell it at a higher margin. Are you winning or is some corporation's bottom line winning? And it, yeah. if the answer is the corporation's bottom line is winning and it's not a more nutritive compound for me, I don't need to go down the rabbit hole of, is this making me sick or not? Like I, for, for me, it's a very easy and obvious answer. And this is what I'm talking about with the connection to the food system. Like if, <laughs> if it's just a thing that your body, your meat bag is consuming, then you don't even ask these questions. It's, it's, and I think right now as well, like our listeners and your listeners, like people in our community are getting smarter and smarter to ask those right questions. Like if they look at a study, it's like who's, who's funding that study? Who, who is doing that study? You know, what sort of conflict of interest do they have? And who's paying for it? You know, at the end of the day, like what does this data ultimately bring to, you know, bring benefit to, um, those kind of questions should have been asked way earlier and not just trust, you know, oh, he's got a science degree, he's got a doctorate degree from Harvard or whatever. Um, 
like even even on on my podcast, like sometimes people all oh, oh he's he's being paid by HVMN and he's a research lead. And I said, yeah, I am the research lead, and I do generally believe in ketone IQ, but ultimately. I don't care how you get into ketosis. You can get into ketosis via ketogenic diet, via intermittent fasting, via ketone salts, MCT. It doesn't matter. Whatever way that is sustainable to you and get the benefit, get the most benefit out of it and the best buck out of it, then you should do that way. Um, so I think that sort of transparency and scientific integrity is very important, especially I think especially we need that, especially from big corporations and big institutions who essentially run the policies where the money is. I get to interview all these doctors, scientists and cool people in this health and fitness industry, all made possible because of this podcast that is funded by the company I work for, which is Health via Modern Nutrition or HVMN. And it is not that they pay me to do this, but I genuinely love and believe in the product Ketone IQ. I use it every day before my podcast, before my workout, or even after my workout for recovery. There hasn't been a single supplement that can give me such a drastic change in subjective feel within minutes as much as Ketone IQ has. For those of you who do not know me, I'm from Malaysia, I got my PhD from the UK, and my passion is in science and chronic diseases, and I believe it is all about transparency, scientific integrity, and about sharing with everyone so that everyone can benefit from it. And if you like this content and our work, please do support us by liking, leaving a review, or sharing with your friends and families, or even buying a shot of Ketone IQ at any Sprouts nationwide in the US, and the first shot is on us. Just scan the QR code and you'll get your money back for your first shot. You can also use the code HVMNPOD20, that is HVMNPOD20, and get 20% off your first purchase at the HVMN website. The unfortunate part about the universities is that they used to be incentivized to be the most pre prestigious. Like cl clout was a real thing in the past and now it's not. It's just money again. And with all of these things, you sort of have to follow the incentive, unfortunately, and ask more questions of who is really winning here from this information. And we live in an economic world. So unfortunately you can't extract anybody from it. And everybody has got to make money so that everybody can eat and have housing and have basic security. And so I don't think the argument of, oh, Lat well, has a salary from HVMN that, you know, therefore his opinion's not credible. If you go out and say, hey, I don't care how you do this. This is important to me that you have metabolic health. I'm doing this because I want to have metabolic health. It's very different than these faceless multinational corporations. And the, I mean, the same thing about me, I, I own a supplement company among many other companies, and I am the first person to say, you need to eat real food that spoils. And do that 100% before you start even thinking about supplementation. And the same thing with farmers. Like every farmer needs to make money or also go to business. But when you go to some, some farms versus others, it's clear which ones are trying to make more money than they are trying to help people and grow healthy food for their community. And this is why it's so important to go meet your local farmer. Is because it may like oh like the greenwashing in the, the agriculture space is so frustrating. I was talking to a reporter from the New York Times that we're going to do a little story about some of this stuff. So many farms in so many places write these wet like flowery language websites talking about oh our animals are on X Y Z pasture and like this or whatever. And you go there, and it's disgusting, and it is only set up to extract dollars out of a machine. And it's sick, and you don't know until you go. And for all these things, the same thing. Like, if you think that's bad, go to a go to a monocrop canola oil field and into like a processing factory, and to where these foods are made and produced, and ask yourself like, who's getting the better end of the deal here? If you meet a local farmer and you can tell how much love they are putting into it, and how much strain they are putting on their life to be able to provide their community with healthy food, that's a very different outcome. I don't care what the nutrition. Test, tell, tell me around something who people are making it just to make money. And so I think with everything you consume, just asking the question of, you know, is, is the main incentive here to extract money from me or is it for me to be a healthier human being? And 
again, this is where I think like, you're not going to find that until you get to the small farm level. It's just, you, you don't really find it. There's some companies like, for example, Force of Nature that are doing a good job with animal agriculture that are running at scale. And they're very far in between, you know, there's like very like mission driven companies that are really trying to do the right thing. Uh, Patagonia is like one for apparel, for example, there's, there's just very few large businesses because at a large business stake, you, you have to start making trade-offs and you have to start doing things for shareholders and you have to start doing things for financial, uh, means more than why the businesses are in the first place. I think that's, that's ultimately what the capitalism world, you know, dictates uh, most of the time and have that pressure for shareholders, for, for companies, for people who run companies. Um, and unfortunately and sadly, that is the world that we live in. And, you know, we can do our little part as individuals and make our own decisions that affect our own sort of lives and our family's lives. But yeah, I mean, we can do what we can, you know, you and I trying to make it scalable, trying to spread this knowledge. And I think this episode is it's an eye opener. And, and thank you for sharing all this information as well um, for people. And I was going to ask, it's like for people who live in the city, you know, how, how do they know if, if they if you ask them to ask the question, you know, who is who is benefiting from this, um, whether it's me from a nutrition val value point of view or the company from a financial point of view and and you answered the question already because you're like well you can't until you get to the farm and actually see it for yourself um and as we talked about you know nutrition nutritious value and i know you you mentioned earlier you know you say you can throw out all these graphs and data about differences between grain fed and grass fed and rotational grazing fed i'm sure a lot of our you know listeners would love to know you know, your, what knowledge you have on that, you know, what's the difference between these different quality of meats and which one are superior and why are they superior based on metabolic health uh, standpoint? Yeah. So the question about metabolic health is a really interesting one. The, the standard way we look and assess nutrition currently is about a hundred years old. So when we look at a food and we see a nutrition pack, facts panel, or we put a food into like a my fitness pal, or even look at a nutrition database, we get roughly 20 markers, some vitamins, some minerals, proteins, carbs, fats. That's it. I'm working with this researcher right now. He's a brilliant man. You should have him on the podcast. His name is Stefan Van Vliet. He's out of Utah State. And he is now looking at, uh, yeah, happy to make it. The guy needs to get his work out there more. It's incredible stuff. So he is looking at 800 plus markers in food and looking at, he is able to assess basically the metabolism of the animal, of the meat that you're eating. All these different compounds. He has so many different compounds, he doesn't even know what some of them are. What he calls this is the dark matter of nutrition. Because what we did is we ran a bunch of studies. I don't know if it was like in the 20s. I did a podcast with Chris Masterjohn on this. Of what do we need so humans don't die of over acute illness? And that's what we think of as nutrition. Like, does it have enough vitamin A, vitamin K? We're like... Does it have magnesium? Does it have these things? Calcium. It is, nutrition is so much more varied than that. And even when it comes down to the form of these vitamins and minerals that we, we understand, when you look at grain-fed, grass-fed, regenerative, we'll just call it those three buckets. And you look at them from a database of like the USDA, just as an example, they'll be roughly the same across the board in all of these markers. But when Stefan does his analysis, he can actually see the form of each of these minerals and vitamins and shows like, oh, this one came from a supplement because it's, it's this form versus that one. So even the gra most of the grass fed animals, and this is what I was getting to with the reporter yesterday in this little expose we're doing of a certain meat in the mail company that I think is very unethical. It's a very large one, very popular in the United States that ships meat to, to your front door. Grass fed is not eating pasture most of the time. Grass fed is a feed, feed lot, they're just, they're on dirt eating grass like pellets. So they're eating feed, tons of animals, land that's devoid of any sort of life. And they're just dumped huge silos of sorghum and other, uh, other grasses. They're basically like sugar pellets. So the animals get fat. They are technically grain free, 
So that means they can say that they're grass fed. It is an enormous sham that nobody understands is happening in the whole grass fed movement. And I want to be careful to say that like, this does not mean we should stop eating grass fed meats or whatever, or stop supporting them. There are still farmers who are doing it the right way. And this, especially through regenerative rotational grazing, it's why you guys, you got to go to the farm. You got to see it because on their website of this company that I'm talking about, they have photos of cattle on lush pastures walking around. I know for a fact that their farms are enormous dirt piles in Brazil where they clear cut the rainforest, throw all these cattle on it. Same where this is the same place where McDonald's gets their beef from. Anyway, that requires them to supplement massively. And then the grain fed is supplemented massively because there's not enough nutrients in what they're eating. They're getting just basically straight sugar. It's the same as eating grains. I would actually argue in some cases, eating grains would probably be better because there's at least a whole food matrix in a lot of the times that they're eating corn and soy. And so you look at the fingerprint of these foods. So when Stefan runs these analyses, he can see, okay, biochemically, what is this food? Like there's like a, basically a fingerprint of what this food is in grain fed and grass, quote unquote grass fed, and then rotational grazing and regenerative are basically three different foods. They, they don't even look the same from chemical analysis. So, so for the difference from a point of chemical analysis, is it the proportion that is different or is there something else? There are literal compounds that don't even exist in most of these animals because of the way that they're produced. So uh, if an animal is raised the way it should be, there are many factors that go into this. So there are the diversity of forage. There's access to water and water quality. There's minerals in the soil and in the water. There is the stress level. There's all these sort of things. There's the microbiome that is formed from a proper ecosystem. So there's an infinite amount of variability, just like with human health that, or with these animals. And so that leads to sort of an infinite amount of variabilities in the actual meat and the qualities and things that are measured in the meat as well. And so in the cases of a lot of the grain fed, quote unquote, grass fed, they have essentially none or a negative amount of inflammatory compounds versus the rotational grazing ones have in some cases that I've seen hundreds of times more polyphenols, different plant chemicals, all this type of stuff because they're actually eating what they should be eating. And so these foods, there's a paper that he has, I can send to you that you can put in the show notes and share it. That's just grass fed versus grain fed, not even bringing in the um, rotational grazing bit. And it is shocking how different it is. I helped them run a study for a wild harvested venison company called Maui Nui. And I can't chat about the results yet, but that compared to, to like a farmed venison, the results are absolutely insane. It's, it makes sense intuitively, but it's not until one of these things where you see the chart in the graph, you're like, holy shit. Like this is, this is significant. Like I want to be eating that thing. And you look at the full ecosystem of like the 800 plus compounds. And a lot of them, it's just classes of compounds, things like that. And it's just 4X, 8X, 100X, this thing. And just to think like how much we're missing across our entire food system, if this is just one sample versus another of this one food. The, wor the work he's doing on elucidating the variability in nutrition in animal products is, I think, groundbreaking and one of the most important things going on in science right now. That no one's talking about. Like he, he could he could open up an entire new way to study nutrition. Like we've literally been studying the same compounds for the last hundred years. We haven't changed anything. We we're not looking at anything new. So get him on the podcast. He's way smarter at this stuff than I am. But it's it's really fascinating. And, it, it, and the great thing about what he's doing too is he's he's taking in the information about the pra the farming practices. And so be, he'll be able to say, oh we see this amount of nutrition if you're doing this type of rotational grazing. And we'll be able to, what he's seeing essentially already, it's a basically a straight line from the better the practices are, the better the output of the nu nutrient density, which you could again, intuitively assume is correct, but he's seeing it in the data, which is all these stuff about like, there's even studies published that says no, there's no difference between grass fed and grain fed of, of beef. And I think it's absolutely ridiculous. When you start getting into pork and chicken, 
this is where the rabbit hole gets really crazy. And this is what I've been focusing on, on my farm personally. Uh, so we tested one group of pigs, corn soy fed, and then one group of pigs, corn free, soy free, just to see how much difference does it matter from just source of feed. Control all of the variables that were getting the same amount of water, same amount of land, they were literally on the same property. Um, but before we get into even like talking about pigs and chickens, when you, we're talking about cattle on grasslands, this makes sense because this is where the animals have evolved. They should be eating grass. This is natural for them. Yes, eating grain will get them fat way faster and will get them to slaughter weight way faster. But overall, it's a, it's a normal way to live, right? Cattle's on, cattle on pasture. Pigs are not pasture animals. And so when people say, oh, this pasture-raised pig, okay, you can theoretically raise some breeds of pigs on pasture. There's one breed called Cooney Cooney that will eat grass, and gra like primarily grass-fed pig. But it takes about two years to fill out that pig, and the amount of weight on them is about half of what a normal pig is. And so, again, when you look at incentives in farming, Pigs and chickens are bred primarily because people will, the, the margin you make on them and how fast you turn them over is way, way more. So a chicken from hatch to harvest is about 45 days. Insane. So the cash flow of the farm can go way faster. Pigs, it's about four to six months. When I told you that there's a spectrum of Grain fed, grass fed, but yeah, don't worry because there's a really good way to do it with this regenerative beef. Same goes with any other ruminant, so lamb, elk, bison, etc. When you're looking at pork and chicken, I don't think that there is any current viable commercial model to provide pork and chicken in a way that I would eat it or in a way that's a species appropriate way. So, let that sink into people because I, I think people really enjoy their pork and chicken, which is totally fine. But even if it's a pasture-raised pig, even if it's a pasture-raised chicken, 99.9% .9 of those will be cor GMO corn and soy fed. And that's primarily what they'll eat. Now, why is that not great? Is because these animals are monogastric animals. So just like humans, the fat that they eat gets incorporated into their tissues and then you eat that fat. And so, for example, I have some studies showing that we were talking about before why seed oils are bad. And it's because you have this high amount of polyunsaturated fatty acid, primary linoleic acid. That should be in most foods, in, especially in the human diet, low single digits, 1% to 4% maybe. And that's what it looks like in most animals and in most fats that we get naturally, besides nuts. And not, yeah, I could argue why nuts are fattening for a reason because they come at winter and they should be making you fat in the first place. That's actually a really smart thing by nature to make you insulin resistant temporarily to make you fat. The percentage of linoleic acid in something like canola oil is like 20%. So like pretty high. The linoleic percentage, because you bioaccumulate it for chickens, is, can be up to 60%. We're getting into the realm of soybean oil. Makes sense if the chicken's eating soy, right? And so when you're eating, even if it's pasture-raised pork and chicken, there's no economic model that can get them to wait fast enough on alternative sources than corn and soy because we fed these animals these sources and selectively chosen the breeds that get bigger and fatter faster on cheap sources of feed. So we're basically left with only the animals that get fat that fast, no matter how like the ethical way you are raising them. And so if you as a farmer want to go out and go like, okay, I want to do a different breed of chicken or pigs, and I want to raise them using a different feed combination. Well, that's fine. But the chicken's going to cost to the consumer $250. It just doesn't, you, like, you, you can't make it work. I haven't seen anybody make it work yet, which is unfortunate. Um, so we tested with the pigs, uh, corn free, soy free blends to see, and like there's some small farms that I've found who like do a lot of, they have like a dairy production, they feed excess dairy, or they do a lot of fruit because they have an orchard to the pigs. And so there's a lot of small farms who are actually doing this a really good way, who are producing pork, for example, that have really low linoleic acid levels. And it's tremendous. One of them is called Wildum Farm, for example. They ship places, they're, they're great. 
Um, but again, like commercially available, I just, I don't think it's possible at scale to make mm. pork and chicken that's low, like species appropriate and low on these amounts of linoleic acid and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe you, you'll be rev revolutionized. Because if you look at the propaganda from plant-based stuff, what's happening and the effect on it is people are eating less and less red meat and they're eating more and more pork and chicken. And I would argue that that's a terrible thing to do given the nutrient density. And even if we go beyond the fatty acid composition and you look at the nutrient density, even on a basic USDA survey, or if you go further to Stefan's data, beef and ruminants are just far superior nutritionally, uh, like on a per gram basis of nutrient density, than pork and chicken, even the best ones that we can find. So if people are eating, they're just replacing the most nutrient dense source of food that we have effectively with less nutrient dense ones that have no way to, to again, you talk about the sustainability of the food system with, with the ruminants, we can indefinitely grow these animals and raise them and eat them and participate in this ecosystem. We cannot, we, there's no model to do that with pork and chicken. There is effectively zero sustainable way to have pork and chicken production currently. So people should eat more red meat, would you say? Um, or sustainable red meat? Versus I'm not pork in the business, chicken. especially after perfect keto days, of really telling anybody what they should be doing with their nutrition. Um, I think that I can just present the data and the data to me, it seems like on a nutrient basis, r ruminant meat is the most nutrient dense meat that has the best, most ethical, most ethical and most sustainable practices mm. for sure. So if you care about the environment, if you care about ethics, if you care about species appropriate behavior, if you care about nutrition for yourself, it is the best. Does that mean that everybody needs to eat red meat? I think that some people actually feel better on different t types of foods. I've just seen enough people and travel around the world enough and done enough research to not be as arrogant to say there's one best human diet. I think that's insane. I think humans are omnivores. And I think that ultimately at the end of the day, getting to the foundational root of eating food that spoils is key. And then on top of that, tinkering around quite a bit to what your goals are. Uh, I think it's, it would be very hard for me to imagine somebody who's thriving to not eat some sort of animal or fish or seafood product. There's not a lot of examples of that, but I know a lot of people who do feel way better on way more plants and a lot of seafood and not a lot of red meat. Like I was, I was just in Japan for two weeks. They don't eat a lot of red meat and the red meat that they eat is a new, a new thing that happened. So this book steak by Mark Schatzker kind of profiled the Japanese Kobe Wagyu sort of thing that happened was like them just perfecting a craft to be like, Hey, we have, we can do the meat the best and it's a delicacy and you get it. And it's like, you get one little slice. You're not eating steaks there. But then you get Hong Kong who eats the some, some most amount of red meat of anybody per capita and living a long time, you know, right next door. And so it, I don't think people need to eat it, but I do. And I think if you feel good eating it, it's a good option. Yeah, absolutely. One last question for you. Should people be concerned um, about their LDL if they eat more red meat and if they see the LDL increase. I think if you're making decisions on your health based upon your LDL marker, you got a long way to go. <laughs> that's, my, that's my short of it. I mean, it, it, I don't even care about this stuff anymore. I mean, you get people who literally waste their entire lives talking about ApoB, LP little A, blah, blah, blah. And I would let those people debate it out. There's far smarter people than me on this type of stuff. Um, so <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would say... If that's how you're making health decisions, you need to go to the small farm and like take a day off the computer and like stop listening to the podcast. <laughs> Good answer. Good, Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked about that a couple of times already. We've asked, you know, doctors who have seen, you know, diabe diabe diabetic patients, obese patients, and, and they have views on LDL overall. So, you know, if you guys are interested, go check out the other episodes. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many stories in, in the carnivore community, especially, or any people going more animal-based, where they've lost weight, they've got enough of medications, their skin's better, like, they, they have more muscle mass, every single marker of health is better, but their LDLC goes up 10%, and the doctor says, you got to stop doing this. It's just, it's so absurd. And so, not, not to say that, it, like, 
yeah, sometimes it's something that maybe could be taking into a broader picture with looking at other markers. Like again, it, <laughs> what are your goals? Are you approaching them? Yes or no? I, I think it's something that should be taken generally in context of other things and likely disregarded and retired in the next 10 plus years. So Anthony, one last thing, you know, if there are anything you would like to promote or share with our listeners, um, the floor is yours and, and tell us where can they find you as well? Yeah. So th the biggest thing I'm working on right now is, like I said, I'm obsessed with the food system. And I think that if we can't make the food system work on a local level, I just don't think we have much hope into figuring out how to make it work at scale. I think that we need to figure out how to make it work at a community level and then replicate that. And that's how we sort of create a resilient food system moving forward instead of having these big industrial farming operations dictating what's going on with our food supply system. So if you're in the Austin area, I'm launching a new project called Rooted Local Meats. So you can just go to rootedlocalmeats.com. And so we've sourced from the best ranchers in the entire area and are bringing it to your door. So we're not shipping anything ever. So we're keeping everything in the community and about 10 times the amount of what you pay goes to directly to the farmer. I'm actually not making any money from this. I'm basically setting up as a nonprofit. Um, I, this is what I care about the most. And so I'm connecting all of these farmers and people locally in Austin, Texas to try to figure out what is the model we can make to really truly see what a proper food system looks like in 2023 and beyond. Like, can we make it resilient? Can we make it from the best farms possible? So love your support. If you care about the stuff, if you're a meat eater, and then anywhere else, just search my name and I should come up on, you know, me to my rants and everything else like that on any social media platform you want to follow. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. It has been such a great conversation. I've learned so much um, from you uh, this episode. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge and your expertise in this area with me and with our listeners. Um, and as, as always, you know, um, always appreciate your, your advice as well. Thanks a lot. All right, I appreciate that.